Hi, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Tales podcast. Delighted today to be joined by Adam Billing. Uh, he is the founder, CEO of Treehouse Innovation, and has been a partner with us for a number of years now. Just, I love conversations, whether they're about work or just generally. Uh, from America, living now in the UK, but his whole demeanor, the way he works, the way he operates, his team, who are exceptional. Uh, they, they, he just brings a different view on life and his work in design thinking and projects, whether it's consultancy or training, uh, again, is a source of inspiration for me. Uh, so you'll hear today about a number of things. You'll hear about an assessment he's working on. You'll hear about some of the work around design thinking. We'll discuss things around the principles of design thinking and how, it's not new, but actually they're fundamental to what we do. So I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback on this. This is one of my favorite conversations that I've had so far in the Leadership Tales podcast. Adam Billing. Adam, welcome to the Leadership Tales podcast. I've been wanting to do this for ages to get us into a conversation. But for those who don't know you, uh, maybe just do an introduction to yourself, your life, your story, your times. But we've only got 35 minutes, mate. So just keep it short. Okay. <laughs> just for the 35 minutes for the introduction. Yeah. Just for the okay. introduction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, absolutely. Colin, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, name Adam Billing. Um, Founder of a company called Treehouse Innovation. I know we partner a lot with Potential Squared, have been doing so for many, many years now. Um, we're a design and innovation company. Uh, as far as how I came to be standing here yeah. um, talking to you, it's, you know, so it's a long and twisted tale, but it all started in, in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I'm originally from, kind of in the late 90s, where I uh, was working for Ernst & Young Consulting. Hmm. And uh, I, I had one of those sort of happy accidental moments where I, I was working with a partner in the firm out in San Francisco who was doing a lot of really cutting edge stuff, especially for sort of like 1998 um, around human centered design and innovation. And I was lucky enough to go over there, start working with him. That's where I got to know all about, you know, design thinking and the great um Great businesses like IDEO and things like that, which were which were springing up, and you know, over time, uh, as in his careers evolved, I had an opportunity to come over to the UK to work with the University of Cambridge, and I guess that's been about 16, 17 years ago now. Wow, yeah. And uh, and then in two thousand ten, uh, I was kind of at a crossroads, and um, I was I either either go back to the states or do something in the UK. And I decided to start Treehouse, and that's what I've been doing for the last 13 years now. Wow. Um, and you know, so for those of you who don't know Treehouse, we're a design innovation company. We help all kinds of people and organizations design new products, services, strategies using human-centered design. And we also uh, train people and uh, building up that internal capability and with a big focus on, on leaders, which a lot of that work is still done at the University of Cambridge. Nice. Yeah, and a mutual connection now, and that's a nice University of Cambridge. It always sounds grand, doesn't it? I'm part of the University of Cambridge. It sounds, yeah, it's right. <laughs> um, I'd love to explore the design thinking because the, the evolution of the design thinking idea and other pieces, I'd love to get your take on this because it is still relevant. You know, we might call it one thing, might call it another thing, might call it innovation, but it is still relevant now as much as it was probably in those days when it was first taken from the engineering designer products. But give us your take on the evolution of it and how you've moved it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where it's the naming of things there. That's, that's where the fads are to be found, right? Where you, it's called this and then someone will put a twist on it and then someone will write a, a blog about how it's out and it doesn't work and then someone will say oh no but the new version does because we've combined it with bits of agile and lean startup and you know yeah i think we've we've been doing this long enough and i think you know at treehouse like all of our leadership team we've all got similar sort of histories some of us came from IDEO, some of us came from places like fujitsu or pwc and but basically we've, we've seen a lot of these fads come and go in terms of how people talk about it and market it. But 
I think where we are now, and I think it's the it's the kind of most meaningful under way to understand it is we're not thinking about the names, we're not thinking about the fads, but we're thinking about these sort of immutable fundamental truths about human beings that is, are kind of embodied in this. So it's just, I think it's pretty timeless. Because if you look at design thinking, what is it really besides understand what the people you are designing for or you know related to the problem that you're trying to solve? Understand what they care about before you start coming up with your ideas of what you think is a wonderful you know, solution for them. It's about involving diverse perspectives and coming up with lots of ideas before you settle on one quickly. And then it's about creating rough sketches and prototypes so you can test your assumptions before just building, you know, that thing that you're sure is going to be wonderful. Those principles, those those fundamentals never go away. I mean, those those things exist um, because I think just in, in the world of um, – well, just, just just being human, I think a lot of our natural tendencies uh, steer us down a kind of a, a, an unhelpful path of, you know, leading with our own ideas or not involving lots of people, just taking our own ideas and run with it. And, and, and you know, as soon as we've got a great idea, we just start building and trying to convince the world it's great. Design thinking helps us overcome those very, I think, eternal um uh, challenges that we as people on earth face. So I don't, I don't think it's going anywhere and I don't think it's really changed much. And I love that because there are guiding principles in a lot of ways, aren't they? I mean, we talk about new practices that become habitual, that are ingrained, you know, for example, the, how might we statement for me was transformational to start a strategy session with how might we rather than here's the problem we've got to solve. Yeah. Um, in terms of what we're doing. So the, how might we was instrumental. So when we think about guiding principles, the other thing that I love about what you're saying there is if you just take the putting the user at the center of what you're looking at, the human, yeah. that's where everybody's now saying, oh, empathy, empathy is the new big thing in leadership. And like, no, it's not the new big thing. It should have been there for ages. Yeah. There's, there's always got to be new books, yeah. right? There's always got to be new HBR. So you're blaming the authors then, basically. I'm yeah, good. as, a, as <laughs> one. <laughs> I'm looking right at it. Yeah, it's... No, I think I think yeah. it's it's there are absolute timeless yeah. um, truths that are that are at work here about how people work better together and get to solutions that matter for the people they're designing for. That you can call it what you want, paint it any color you want, but a lot of those things are embodied in human centered design. Hmm. And I love the. I'd love to explore a bit of the work you do because you know you and I were having a conversation the other day about experimenting, and you know some of the some of the constructs in design thinking are quite difficult to get your head around. You know, one observing without judgment for me is always as a judgmental person with lots of opinions. I really struggle with that, but I think that the key thing for me is this concept of experiments and the experimental mindset. And you're working with Gene in terms of the. The diagnostic. I'd love to just dig into that because there's there's a power in that and and the thinking, the insights you've got from doing that. Do you want to explain a bit about what the work is? Yeah, sure, sure. No, happy to. Um, I mean, so I think experimentation again, kind of going back to that principle is almost you know looking at design thinking as a way of protecting ourselves from our own worst uh, you know reflexes. Um, experimentation, I think, is the toughest thing to 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 embed in a lot of ways because yeah. what do we mean by that first mm. of all um it's the idea is, is when you have a you know a new idea or a new solution that you're super excited about you know you had that eureka moment in the shower or whatever it's changing your natural reflex for at least for many of us that natural reflex is okay I'm going to start building it up and I'm going to go around and start showing some people and, and, and basically convince them what a great idea it is. And if I really want to convince them, I, I really need to build this thing out. Maybe I need to have a spreadsheet that's going to show how much money it makes or a PowerPoint where the formatting is perfect, you know, that, that, that shows what the sales pitch will look like. I'm going to you know really build it out. As opposed to doing that, it's listing out very systematically, immediately, what those key assumptions you're making around the user, the ultimate customer, whoever it is for this idea, what they'll be able to do and willing to do or interested in doing. 
and then going out and, and testing each one of those assumptions one by one, really and doing as quickly as you can to, to kind of get that really early learning into your idea and finding out what's wrong with it. Because every new idea is born with all kinds of inherent flaws, but finding out what those are really early. Um, so if, that, if, we, if we think about that's what we mean by experimentation, um, and I mean, if it's helpful, I can give a, 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 a yeah. specific example. That'd be great because, I mean, some of the work that we talk about, yeah. some, I mean, some of the work you're doing, say, in the government and other areas is fascinating because it affects everybody on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, and I think some a real example would be brilliant for people who are struggling to understand it. Yeah. Sure. And I'd say I'm, I'll, give one, I'll give one that isn't from one of our projects, but yeah. I think it's, it's a great illustration of, of, um, of how experimentation works. So there was a company um, – it was called Census in Australia, and they were looking for, for some new ideas with new solutions to engage their kind of current user base. And one of the concepts they came up with was this for, for an app called Skip. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll give you the basics of what that is. Skip was an idea that said, in the morning, if you're going to work in the morning, you can select what you would like to have for lunch on that day. And you could choose it from any of these skip registered cafes or restaurants in the area. Then when that lunchtime came, you would go to that restaurant where you'd be able to skip ahead in queue. That's the, the name. Nice. So like it. Very simple, but very clear. Your lunch and, and go. Right. <laughs> so that was this basic idea. And they think they were kind of at the four frame storyboard level of development where as opposed to, like we were just saying, going, this is a lovely idea. Everyone's going to go crazy for it, right? Uh, let's just build it. You know, we, we know it's going to be a success. Let's go for it. Um, instead of doing that, they resisted that urge and systematically listed out the assumptions. Mm. Um, so even from that little simple description I just gave of the concept, you can probably hear some of the assumptions that are baked in there. Yeah. So things like we're assuming that, Oh, that restaurants are going to be able to handle those orders. We're going to, we're assuming that, um, that, you know, let's, hopefully the skip line doesn't become longer than the regular line if it gets too, too popular. Um, we're assuming, you know, all, all kinds of things about, about this. We're assuming that people really want to, to be picking up lunch as opposed to, uh, are they, or what time they know what time they're going to eat. Is that going to work? Right. Um, so they listed all these different assumptions. And the number one assumption that they decided to test first was that people will actually know what they want to eat for lunch in the morning, right? Yeah. So the way they tested it and the experiment they used, something really super simple. One of the guys from the design team took a flip chart and he wrote on it, do you know what you want to eat for lunch today? Yes, no. And he stood outside of an office building at like 830 in the morning and as people were coming in, he was just like, you know, do you know what you want to? Yes. No. Yes. No. And he brought Love it up it. to his design team and he showed them and said, well, turns out, no. <laughs> people don't know at yeah. 830 in the morning what the heck they want to eat for lunch that day. Mm -hmm. So what they learned in that very, very short, like thinking a half an hour, whatever it took them experiment, was it, it really helped them inform the design. So that, that told them they needed something around Helping people, helping people make that decision. So, like you know, previous orders or recommended, so, you know, recommended choices from from local vendors, things like that to help that. Now that got built into the app, and that's an important piece of it. And that really critical learning is something that they got before they you know wrote a single line of code or spent a single dollar on development. So that's what we mean by by experimentation, testing specific assumptions in really fast experiential ways so we can iterate before we build. I love that. It reminds me of the um, the water. There was a time in luxury hotels where people were differentiating. So they thought, great idea, we'll have a water menu, like a wine menu of different waters from around the world. I so I once... I went to this restaurant and my daughters loved this, you know, Aquapana, the different, so they were testing the different types of water. So they'd done this full stocking of the hotel with waters and the menu. What they hadn't worked out in the experimentation is the impact of that was, uh, you know, environmental 
flying the water, cost of water, all of that. And there's such a big kickback to say, firstly, would they people pay for the water? Secondly, the environmental impact was the big one. So that rather than experiments, they went full on to do it and they had to withdraw all of their work. So that's what we're talking about, isn't it? That is a wonderful example. And I'm going to borrow that one and I'll get <laughs> full credit for yeah. For it. that's now that is a great that's a great example and a perfect illustration of, of the kind of thing we're talking about, um, and where it's just going back to your original question, yeah. I sort of laid some some foundation around what the what the heck we're talking about with experimentation, because um, it is a very specific thing. It is. You know, it's specific. It's not just being experimental as a genuine as a general way of you know uh, approaching life. It is. Listing assumptions and then testing them individually in these very experiential ways. And we always say you want to test for do, not for say, mm. um, right? It's just, it's just, hey, would you like this product? Most people would go, yes, because they, they know that's what you want to hear. Um, but it's just to see if they will actually do something or make some little change in their behavior. That's that's how you know your experiment is, is strong. But Going back to your question about uh, the work that we're doing with Jean Lidka, mm -hmm. um, for any of your listeners who don't know who, who Jean is, she is um, – actually, I've got a book. just happens to be handy. Nice. Um, so she's – this is one of my favorite um, design books. This was uh, – gosh, this is about 10 years old or so now. Mm -hmm. But as you can tell, it's a well um, – I like it. For the visual, for those listening, it's a well-worn – stickies in all over the place yeah, oh, yeah. it's great yeah love it planning for growth no, that's wonderful and her uh, most recent book i wasn't planning on doing the plugs here but books oh, show. Uh, experiencing design also really really good jean litka she's at the darden school of business in the u.s university of virginia and i mean she's just one of the absolute leading thinkers in human-centered design big fan for a long time um she sent me the manuscript of her um most recent book, I guess now almost two years ago, um, just for a bit of feedback, and, and we started talking, and we realized we had a lot of um, you know a lot of common areas of interest, and we really aligned. And one of the big things was in her research, she was looking at what are like the specific behaviors and, and skills that people bring, not just to like a design project, but to their everyday work. Mm. Right. So if we take a look at everything we've just talked about with experimentation, those some of those same principles, some of those same behaviors, if you kind of pick them apart and say, that, so what's really in that? So, you know, having this um, behavior or habit of, of identifying your assumptions before you build yeah. for, you know, you know, seeking to get, um, you know, to not just to validate but to learn about your idea early. So some, some of those, those fundamental behaviors are really the things that don't just help people innovate better, but help them be better marketers or accountants or, you know, what, whatever it might be. And, and she's done a heck of a lot of work of, of not just sort of helping people assess where their strengths are, but also prescribing some really simple, tangible actions to help them get better at those things. Nice. Um, so, so yeah, I think so. With the, the work with Gene, it's resulted in a we have an assessment product called Innovation Impact um, Skills Assessment that draws on about a decade of her research and a, a good a portion of it. I mean, we we look at the empathy piece, we look at ideation, but there's a lot of those sort of even like scientific reasoning skills mm. that, that fall into this, this realm of experimentation and break it down into really tangible things you can integrate in your everyday to, to sort of do this well. And Can you give the listeners a couple of examples of those? Because I think those are the bits, you know, that it's this combination of design thinking, critical thinking, you know, logic. So people think, oh, design thinking is just for creators, but actually the combination of these things is important, Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, and I think we, if we look at scientific reasoning skills, it's things like um, like when a test, I'm just pulling up the Yeah, assessment. no. That's... So one of the behaviors might be when a test gives me a different answer than I was expecting, I explore the data rather than reject it. Interesting. Now, that's one of those things I think a lot of us would love to say, well, of course we do. 
but there is again, you know, coming back to that design as, as a mechanism for helping us overcome those things that are, uh, you know, the, the, those habits within us that are not so helpful, but maybe do come naturally. You know, that when you get that conflicting data, it is so tempting to say, well, this must be wrong because I'm so I'm such an expert in my field that I'm so certain it must be right. Yeah. But sort of being able to step back from that is <laughs> is key. Um, it's the same thing. I use what I learned to alter or pivot, even abandon new ideas, which is incredibly hard for people yeah. to do. That's um, my I've, biggest one. I find oh, that the most difficult. It's unbelievably difficult. And I'm right there with you. Um, yeah, I, I treat new ideas as hypotheses to be tested. And I think, you know, that, those two things are interlinked, right? And, I, and, and so much of, of this, you know, again, there are a million and one tools and templates and things out there for people to use that can help them, you know, innovate and become more innovative every day. But it is that change that has to happen in people where these things are, they become ingrained, they become inherent. That where when I have a new idea, I'm no longer trying to fight against those, you know, in early inclination, original inclinations of run with it, defend it, build it, convince others it's brilliant. Huh. And naturally having that like a, a genuine impulse to, to feel that, yes, this idea is a hypothesis. And what should my next step be? Well, naturally, it should be to test assumptions and start, you know, experimenting. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it, it really is a transformational process that people go through to just really change the way they think and the way they respond to the you know, situations and stimulus in their, in their everyday world. I think this is the, the great thing about that, um, assessment, which I love and the experimental mindset is it links into some basic behaviors that we can almost use, not use as a checklist, but there's a piece for me, just thinking about my energy and I measure it on the Ura ring. I measure my sleep and how I'm sleeping and the effectiveness. And now I've got to the point where I know the patterns of habits that will cause me to go to bed at nine o'clock, get up at five, and therefore I've had eight hours of great sleep, wake up refreshed. But I also know what doesn't work because I've measured it. So I've measured the fact that if I have a couple of glasses of wine, which I like, then my sleep will be affected. But when we're experimenting, we're going through that the decision to let something go yeah, or to make a conscious choice because we don't want to be this, you know, boo, hiss person that says everything good in your life or everything you enjoy in your life to remove. But it's, it's that piece about what is the impact of that behavior. For example, we had a team meeting, which is 9.15 in the morning, which for half the group they loved because it was social connection. We're a hybrid organization. Therefore, that, you know, people connection was important. But for half the group, they hated it because it was time they weren't working. Yeah. So going into the measurement of why we would keep it or how we would change it is important and not just listening to the loudest voices going, yeah, scrap it. It's not useful. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Absolutely. So go back to some of the insights because this is the experimental mindset was uh, something you gave me, which was, was brilliant because it's different to experimenting. It's a mindset and and, and where's your thing? Because you've iterated this diagnostic and you've taken it in a different direction. Do you want to explain a bit about that? Yeah. You know, you, you asked earlier about sort of how we feel about design thinking and its evolution. And and I said, you know, my answer in, in short was basically there's nothing new under the sun. Yep. There, These are fundamental practices and truths about the way humans work and interact with each other and work together. Um, and I think that has has guided in a lot of ways the sort of evolution of where we've gone with the assessment hmm. because in its first inter iteration the behaviors there's these 44 behaviors um also called minimum viable competencies hmm. uh, from, from the initial research that jean uh, did with her team and it is about 10 years worth of, of, of research that's gone into that um but those 44 behaviors uh, we had aligned to steps in an innovation process because we were very much thinking about design as a you know as like a project journey or, or a, a process that you move from one end to the other. Even if you're jumping back and forth, there's still defined steps. And over the last year, we've kind of stepped back from that yeah. again and kind of recognizing that that process 
isn't what's important, right? What's important are some of the core skills that you develop that are evidenced by, by some of these specific behaviors. So we looked at, you did some factor analysis, basically, and realized you've got sort of five key skill areas. So things around relationship skills and like the scientific reasoning and, um, and also things like presencing the ability to bring ideas to life for other people, like through prototyping or whatever that is. But these were things that for most people, this is kind of the standing back moment. Most, even though it's great to sort of teach human centered design in a sequential way, most of the people, like we were saying, if you're a marketer or an accountant or a lawyer, you're not going to be doing a design project, probably. You're not going to be following a, a set methodology. But the ability to take those behaviors, like the ones we just talked around about experimentation or things, you know, do with empathy. These behaviors, when you separate them from the process, which is exactly what we did in the second iteration, and just recognize that these behaviors can be practiced in an ad hoc you know, manner, so kind of integrated with your everyday work. So if we're talking about, uh, for example, a, a behavior related to relationship skills, um, if it is listening deeply with curiosity to the person you're designing for and not bringing in your own perspective. Now that is a essential behavior yeah. if you are doing a design project, but it's also an essential part of, like if, if talking to a customer, talking to a team member, conversations mm -hmm. that people are already having every day. And I think it was that shift from thinking about the assessment is where are these strengths as you move through a journey versus how do these strengths, when you disconnect them from a design journey, you know, how do they stand up and how do they show up in, in a way that they can be integrated independently uh, of any fixed process into more people's everyday work? So that, that was the fundamental shift, decoupling from process and making the behaviors much more about things I practice every day, regardless of any sequence or project context. Love that. And it, it, what's resonating to me is going back to why. So I was introduced to design thinking through our mutual friends at uh, Experience Point, and we were sharing that. And but some of the principles I learned in there are exactly what we're talking about here. So, you know, my favorite quote: Jimi Hendrix, "Knowledge speaks, wisdom listens," and it's that piece that wisdom listening is more important as a leader. So if we shift into the leadership side, if yeah. I'm sitting listening without judgments. And I'm picking up so much more than in there. And it's it's almost, you know, rather than starting on converging on the solution, being in love with the problem mm -hmm. is a classic another principle in there. And, you know, so therefore it's an infinite game to Simon Sinek. So all of these add into this concept that this design thinking and these this uh, diagnostic you're talking about, assessment, is so much a benefit to leaders as well. I'd love to get your view on leadership and that, because you're running a design thinking business and you're the leader. And you and I have had many conversations, which this leadership stuff is hard. <laughs> yeah. Without a doubt. We've worked with Sky for, mm -hmm. for a lot of years. And we've worked with a few hundred of their, of their top leaders. And the kind of you know, the first thing we put up when we talk about you know, human centered design is you need to try it before you can lead it. Mm -hmm. um, because we recognize that uh, a lot of times with, with your senior leader, you you may not be sort of the frontline innovator. You might not be on these projects, but again, it's, it's sort of not about that, right? Yeah. It's about sort of really kind of two things. It's about making, and this is a huge piece of it. I'm, hopefully, we'll talk about it more later. But it's I think this is the second podcast, Adam, when we get to oh, it. Really, you know, let's yeah. let's let's just whet the appetite for the second one. Yeah, beautiful. But so it's like we're going to making it safe for other people in your team to try mm -hmm. these things out. But then, like we were saying before, from the assessment, being able to look at those individual behaviors and, and integrate those into your leadership style, because you know, you mentioned like the how might we. Um, kind of approach at little shift from as a leader saying to your team, um, I need you to, you know, 
hit X target. We need an X, X, X target uh, advertising spend increase by X date. Yeah. Okay. Versus how might we make our advertising resonate with more of X demographic or something, yeah. right? The moment you open that, how might we, you're allowing that team to kind of fill it in with whatever idea they can come up with, right? With mm-hmm. You're giving them a lot more power. You're giving them a direction, you know, it's like how might we create X value for X, um, you know, user that, that, we're, that we're, we're seeking to create value for. But you're giving a lot more of that power just by changing the phrase, mm-hmm. uh, how might we do it? Because we're not assuming that there's one way of doing that. And you're, uh, you're inviting that team to kind of bring their own, creativity um, into the space. Hmm. So I think what we find when we work with leaders, I was, I was just um, actually again, back at, back at Cambridge yeah. um, uh, working with a great group of leaders from a big media business. And we were looking at human centered design. We were using the, the, the instrument there as well. But I think the, the, the kind of, the, if I was working with a project team, I think hmm. we'd be looking at those things very practically tactically i think the exact same behaviors work within a leadership contest because fundamentally it's the same thing yeah. it's just sort of retailoring those those behaviors to to reflect the context that they're going to be um, experienced within right mm. so if i'm on a project team my how might we is about guiding me towards human-centered solutions around the challenge based on an insight. If I'm a leader, I'm using that same method to empower my team to bring their creativity to a challenge that I've helped point them in the direction of. So I love that because it's leaving your ego and expertise at the door, which is one of my favorite expressions I picked up from design thing. It's like, so I might have the best idea, but normally in my experience, I don't. And therefore my team have the best ideas is the principle. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. I, lo- I want to just pick up because Josh Seiden, who was a guest in the podcast, written a book called Outcomes. And what we're mm-hmm. talking about here is rather than outputs, it's outcomes. Mm-hmm. And that's a core part. And then there's the Josh Burson book, Irresistible, where he talks about this project focus. Because I always remember Tim Brown giving the answer to a question about why does design thinking fail when it goes back into an organization? A lot of the times it's because the organization is structured around functions, divisions, rather than teams and projects. And he said, if I had to change one thing. Now, Josh Burson's book is now irresistible. It's saying bringing some of the agile team methodology in, getting people to to bring that into the how we run our business is the way of the future. I just want to get your views on that because it's outcomes and then project teams is a way of getting this to live and breathe. Yeah. The notion of, of why design yeah. thinking fails or, or doesn't take root. Um, yeah, I can see the, the, is it because of the way teams are structured? That's a part of it for sure. Um, and this is just drawn from, from mm. our personal experience. I would even, I'd go one level higher. That feels like almost a symptom more than a, than, than, than a cause. Mm. I would say if you, not to put everything on the back of leadership, nope. But um, design thinking in general requires people to do things that aren't exactly within the status quo. Not that they're horribly radical or anything, mm-hmm. but even, for example, like you might have the, a process that says in order to do anything new, you need to first provide that business case and the risk register and you know these types of things. And frankly, for a new idea, that's not possible. Right, yeah. the business case for a new idea is just BS. Yeah, always. I mean, <laughs> Quote really, Adam Billing, two thousand and twenty-three. Love it. You don't know squat. You don't exactly. know squat. So you start going out and testing and doing this thing. But most organizations aren't set up mm. or expecting that prototyping approach, that mm. that experimentation approach. I mean, some are, but mm. I think what ends up happening when we and this has happened in, in more times than I'd like to to, to admit to, because it's, it's it's out of our control to some extent, and it's always very sad when it happens. But we will introduce some of these methods to some really smart, really engaged, really enthusiastic, keen folks within an organization, and then take it back, try it out, just to encounter 
a leader who doesn't get it, yeah. isn't familiar with it, knows that it's different and doesn't like it. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't get it. And they put themselves at risk. Yeah. And that I think is the most dangerous thing. I think it, it happens so much. If you think about anybody who's working in a job, in a corporation, you know, if we're if we're being frank here, you know, people are mission driven. Of course they are, values driven, they're committed to the organization, all that stuff. Hmm. But they're also thinking about their job and their career stability, yeah. their reputation. And oftentimes with innovation, you, you're asking people to do is stick their neck out mm -hmm. to try something that they've never tried before in a real life in, in real life situation where there are real stakes. And if leadership isn't able to provide that air cover, mm -hmm. that explicit safety, that this is OK, if that person tries this and gets that slap on the wrist. Yeah. We're trying, you can bet they're never going to try it again. Yeah. That you're never, you're, it, it will not, I mean, going back to Tim Rapp Brown's thing, it mm -hmm. will not take root. So I would say that the biggest thing that keeps it from embedding is the right kind of engagement with leadership. Leaders should really know how to recognize these different mm -hmm. methods, how to reward them, how to model them themselves, yeah. uh, and make it safe for people to actually try this stuff out and not carry the risk you know, if it doesn't go perfectly the first time, which it rarely does. Yeah. And and we know examples of really good leaders who do that on a regular basis and they're living and breathing it every day. Yep. And there's a humility, there's a vulnerability. And this is why I love the psychological safety, vulnerability, humility, yep. Rennie Brown stuff around the man in the arena, getting in mm. there and doing the work. Yep. I mean, we know that firstly to live and work in a business that's doing all of that is exciting. You know, it's energizing. But to have a leader who's willing, to, you know, to look at their job, their future, and say, it's easy for me because I own my own business. Well, it's sort of easy, and I can take the risks, and I mm -hmm. suffer the consequences. But if I'm in a corporate structure mm -hmm. to do that with a whole lot of other leaders who are protecting their back or only out for themselves, it's very difficult. Very yeah. tough. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural thing, and I think the, it's the cause versus the symptom. I think the way – Teams are structured is one of the things that falls out of that. I yeah. think the way performance is evaluated is one of the things that falls out about that. So, I mean, silos, mm -hmm. I know we know they're bad, but they got built for a reason because yeah. there's a certain organizational efficiency behind it, but the cross-pollination gets – but all all of these things are, are barriers for sure. I love that. I love to end the podcast on a negative, but it sets us up for version two where we get stuck into the next part of it. Um, it has been brilliant to talk this. I mean, for, for firstly, for people who want to go and have a go at the assessment, how would they find out about it? That's the first question on that. Yeah. So, yeah, if you just went to treehouseinnovation.com, click on assessments, and, and you can get it right there. Yeah. And you're working on an ROI, return investment one. I was yes, looking that's there as well. Beta. Yeah. It's, that's in beta right now. That's So the assessment we've talked about here, which is called Innovation Impact Skills. Mm -hmm. And it is very much an individual. Uh, so there's a self-assessment. There's also a peer sort of 360 nice. version of that assessment. And we have a dashboard where you can see uh, like if it's deployed within a team or within an organization, you can see um, well, basically, you know, function by function, where are the variances, team by team, where are the variances. Um, so it's, it's a good way to get sort of a snapshot of where capabilities and, and levels of confidence in these different behaviors sits. The ROI is based on, it's again in partnership with Gene Litka, but it's mm. and it's a, a separate uh, body of research all around the outcomes of doing nice. these things. And that's at the organizational level. And there we would administer it to a cross-section of people within a business. So it's not something you can go and click and take yourself like yep. the skill, but it's something where it, it, it's much more of, a, of, a, of an audit that, that we would perform with a with a company. I'd love to do that with our team, actually, just to to work it through. It'd be great. We should do that. Do um, I want to end with the, the questions I normally uh, end with. Uh, so okay. the the first one is is literally looking at the one moment that has shaped small moment that shaped your leadership career. What would it be? Uh, you know, I'll tell you, I would come back 
um, to what we were talking about, about creating that, that safety. I think when, when we do this kind of work, it is sometimes really easy to forget the environment that the people actually work in, live in. Um, when they take this wonderful stuff that we're introducing and, and, and try to implement it. Um, and, you know, I think I, I, I was a bit naive, I think, sometimes in assuming that, you know, if you give people the tools, you give them the methods, you send them on their way, off they go. Um, working with a, a fellow named Dave Henderson, who um, I've got an, a huge amount of respect for. He is the CTO at Global Media. Hmm. And I was working in his team. His teams have been consistently innovative over the last handful of years. We've been working with them for about seven, eight years now, I guess. Nice. Um, but every new group that we've worked with within his team, they, people always say the same thing. I know one person put it perfectly. She was, told me that if an idea succeeds, team gets the credit. Mm -hmm. If an experiment fails, Dave takes the heat. Nice. And everybody knows it. Yeah. And... I think that that, I think the kind of that moment of hearing her say that, mm. just it clicked for me that like yeah. all of this tools, all of this, everything that you're throwing at people, unless you make it safe, it's all for naught. Yeah. And that I think I always return to that whenever I'm looking at a, a project or whenever I'm looking at the way we are approaching sort of a cultural transformation that is always my focus and mm -hmm. and it's um yes yeah, it's, it's really changed the way I, I i think about how change happens in a, in a business i love that so that going back to your point about air cover isn't it it's that's air cover to allow people to to have a soft place to land yeah 100 yeah. percent. and with, without that you can you can kiss any hopes of, of, of a successful initiative goodbye because people are just human after all yeah. and they're not going to and why should they no. Why should they take a, a risk for an organization if that organization is going to slap them on the wrist for doing so, if it doesn't work out perfectly? Amazing. Yeah. Second question then is, if you had to disrupt one thing in leaders nowadays, what would it be? Yeah, I think it, feel, it feels almost like an obvious answer, but I think ego, mm. not that any of us are, are, are devoid of egos, or, but it, I think now more than ever, Having that expertise mm. and the certainty of what your customer wants and all those mm. things that I, you know, and if you're a leader, right, so you're probably making a, a good salary. You've progressed yeah. in your career. I feel like there's this expectation, well, I'm in this position, so I should know what my customer wants. I should know that. That's part of my identity. Like my ego is driven by my, my awesomeness at my job and my knowledge of my, of my customer. And while that, I think, helps people be great practitioners within their domain, within their professions, I think it's that same ego that stands in the way of change and yeah. doing things new and in, in new ways and seeing seeing the world from, from different perspectives. And I think now, <laughs> starting to sound, in these unprecedented times of acceleration, <laughs> But I mean, honestly, things are coming. Give me a soapbox and you're off. Go on, go on. But, but I mean, things are coming. I mean, frankly, yeah. everybody we talk to, things are coming at them so fast. Yeah. And everyone's trying to kind of hold on to the illusion that, you know, we got it covered. We get it. Yeah. It's not possible. You know, it's it, and I think a whole a big dose of humility and a big uh, dose of curiosity. Mm -hmm. In, in place of that ego and that certainty and that desire to kind of have the answer, I, I, I think can can take people uh, can take people a lot further right now. Um, Talking my language, ego is the enemy. Ryan Holiday, one of my favorite books, because it just it goes back to Stoics. Ego is the enemy. Ambition, greed, everything else. I love that, Adam. It's brilliant. Final question for you then. Sure. What is the one leadership habit that's non-negotiable for you? I think it'd be consistency. Mm, love that. I think the you know I think about you know leaders that I've worked with. I think of some of my sort of early bosses at at Ernst and Young. You know, I know that no one is is 
is perfect, right? No, no leader ever, because we're human. Yeah. Um, and I think about the people that I was most motivated by were the people that I knew I could trust, mm -hmm. that I could, you know, like I said, everyone has imperfections. I wasn't looking for a perfect leader to follow, but I was, I, I just knowing mm -hmm. with confidence that the person that I was dealing with today is the same person I'm dealing with tomorrow. And that I didn't have to worry about, um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't have to worry about that 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 horrible instability mm -hmm. that comes when you perceive that lack of consistency. Consistency when someone says one thing one day, something the next. I think that shuts that shuts trust down in its tracks. Mm -hmm. And I think without trust, um, yeah, why why would you want? Why would you? Why would anyone want to follow anyone that they don't? But they don't trust. I love that because it's this it's an important message we've been talking about design thinking, innovation, creativity. But however, the mm -hmm. stakes and the almost the um, foundations that that is built on for leadership yeah. is about consistency. And I, I think that's a yeah. powerful message. It's first time it's been an answer on here, and I think it's mm -hmm. probably one of the most important. So love that. Yeah, you know, and, and I wonder if if it came top of mind even talking about. Uh, Dave Henderson. Dave. Dave would be bright red if you knew I was talking about him. Like, that. yeah, but, uh, yeah. I think you know, working with his teams mm. year after year and hearing such consistent, um, you know, repetition of he takes the blame if it goes bad, he gives the credit if it goes well. That's Dave. That's consistent. People count on it, and then what happens? People thrive. Yeah, and. Some of the businesses that have sprung out of his group are, I mean, one of the, the digital audio exchange, for example, when we first started working with them, it was about 500,000. It's something like 60 million in revenue for them wow. now. Yeah. Uh, and his team just, they just go for it because, you know, it all comes back, right? They know they can and they know they've got that consistent level of support with Dave. You know, you don't, you don't cross the chasm, you know, on a bridge you're worried might collapse beneath your feet. They're not worried that's going to happen. They trust him. As always, it's an amazing pleasure to, to talk to you. And actually for the first time talking, well, not the first time, but talking on the podcast and getting the message out there. So yeah, part two, please would be great. If people want to hear more about you, let's, where would they come to find out about you, the business and also sprint base, which we haven't mentioned at all. So yeah. Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, we're out there, obviously, on, on, on social media. We spend a lot of time out on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the all the places, Treehouse Innovation. You can't you can't uh, you can't miss us. And, you know, we, 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 we try to to get a few thought pieces out um, when we when we can. But we're, I think we're always, always interested in, in, in more conversations with more people. It's how we learn. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I just say for anybody who like to talk to me or talk to anybody else, just don't hesitate to find us on social, hit us up on the website. We're, we're always around. Amazing. Adam, until the next time, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Colin. Thanks so much for having me. So that was Adam Billing, part one of a conversation. I could take so many different things out of, out of that conversation. I, for me, one is the assessments uh, and that experimental mindsets, those behaviors, and how taking the design thinking process out of there and thinking about how these patterns of habits or behaviors, however you want to call them, can lead to a different way of leading, a different way of working is powerful. I think the second thing for me is this consistency piece and this contrast between this belief in experimentation, creativity, innovation, and then this consistency of the leader in that role about providing a, a bedrock, that piece that they're you know, crediting the team when it goes well and blaming themselves when it doesn't go well and therefore allowing a safe place to land for for the team and I, that resonates to me. I think it is a, a key principle in what we do in leadership. What always comes back to me when I listen to a conversation with Adam is that the underpinning nature of leadership in this innovation space is the ability to 
to react, to pivot, to hold certain principles, certain assumptions, and then work with those and those habits to be successful. But this project focus, experimentation, and then this measurement and the tough decisions on whether you bin ideas or scrap ideas or keep them going is the whole principle for me of leadership in what we do and how we do it. So therefore, fascinating conversation. Hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to welcoming you on another episode of the Leadership Tales podcast very soon.